Today's episode of the Occupy Wall Street Show is brought to you by Mt. Gox, mtgox.com, online Bitcoin exchange, and the Thank You Economy by Gary Vaynerchuk, thankyoeconomybook.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second episode of the Occupy Wall Street Show. Today, we are going to talk about um, what's happening in the Occupy movement, especially this week. The biggest news has been recent events in Oakland, California, with um, Marine veteran Scott Olson being shot by local Oakland police, uh, an army, literally, of uh, riot police who were shooting uh, all sorts of things, you know, grenades, uh, you know, smoke and flash grenades and rubber bullets and all sorts of things into, um, you know, what looked like a, a lightly dispersed crowd of uh, peaceful protesters and uh, the results of that. Um, today, my guests are uh, fourth generation residents of Oakland, California and Occupy Oakland participants uh, almost since the beginning, Molly Costello and Matt Eigelhart. Are you guys there? Yeah, we're here. Hey, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having us. So tell us the, uh, the situation. I mean, well, first of all, let's start at the beginning. Um, when did you get involved in the Occupy movement? We actually, the, we really got heavily involved on the um, October 15th. It was a day of global, that, that um, Occupy Wall Street was calling for uh, global action for people to join together. Right. And so we went down there first on October 15th, which I think was maybe three days maybe after the Occupy Oakland had started. Oh and we God. went down to bring the people who were camping out and doing the hardcore protesting a bunch of breakfast burritos with a <laughs> local uh, Oakland food truck, a truck called uh, Gorilla Grub. Mm -hmm. And we went down and that was our first day of getting involved and we were so impressed by the organization, by the spirit of the people of Oakland, and by the Oakland General Assembly that we've been going down every day since October 15th. Wow, that's fantastic. So what, are the, what is the issue or issues that most motivated you to get, in, to, um, you know, get excited about and get involved in, in the Occupy movement? Well, uh, clearly, uh, when you talk to a lot of people, um, you know, there's a lot of money in politics. Our, our political system right now is leaving a lot of people feeling disenfranchised. Um, I mean, people talk about this when you just talk to them on the street or in a bar. You know, everybody's on the same page about this. And, uh, you know, it's really frustrating for citizens in this country who don't have tons of money and can't write big checks to politicians. Um, but have actual, you know, legitimate grievances that we need addressed. Right. We believe right. right now that the government is not a true democracy. The government is not of the people, by the people, and for the people. The government is of the super wealthy who are, can afford to lobby and get laws passed that benefit them, not right. the 99. Yeah, the way, the way I've been describing it is that it's... Um, it's not votes that get uh, politicians elected, it's dollars. So it's all about dollar bills. So, of course, if, um, you know, if you have people voting and that actually determines who's elected, that's democracy. But if you have dollar bills doing the voting, then, of course, only the, the super rich are in charge and they will continue to, uh, you know, basically they're hiring all the politicians and uh, paying them off in advance with these donations and grooming them for office long before they even run secretly. And uh, basically stocking all of Washington with their own employees, in effect. And then, of course, everything is, all the laws and every, everything that happens is going to be biased towards their own interests, right? So it's um, a lack of democracy that's, that's happened. And, and the elimination of the middle class as a result. Yes. Absolutely, we agree. And um, we agree that, you know, the... the Everybody deserves to have a voice, not just the people who can afford to have a voice. And I think you put it so 
so well when you said that we're hiring our politicians and that is just not what I thought America was about. Right, yeah, we've been, we've been raised and kind of brainwashed on the, the Hollywood f image of the land of the free. This is a free country, you know, um, the land of the free and the brave and all that, and it's a great, great idea. And actually, it's really a good thing that we have that in our minds mm -hmm. and our consciousness. Unfortunately, it just isn't true right now. What we need to do is reclaim that. And, uh, you know, this, that's why they're calling it, some people are object to calling it a revolution, but I really think that it is, has the potential of being revolutionary, like 1776, like take back our country. Absolutely, absolutely. I, um, I am, I've been calling it a revolution from the beginning, and I've been <laughs> saying, you know, a quote, the revolution will not be televised, and um, <laughs> I appreciate people like you who are actually, um, you know, spreading the true word, mm -hmm. not what corporate media is out there spreading. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to make, you know, one comment kind of related to corporate media and also to you talking about um, hiring our politicians, and that is when we continue that system, those mm -hmm. rich 1% politicians and the good old boys club that they belong to, which I don't, my husband doesn't, the 99% do not belong to that good old boys club, mm -hmm. they are working to keep all of their friends in the good old boys club yeah. rich and to help them. They're creating laws to keep them, their money where it is and to keep the poor people poor. Yeah. I, I didn't say that very well, but it's, you know, the lobbyists and the laws and the tax laws as they are, are all about keeping mm -hmm. the poor poor and the rich rich and exactly what you said, getting rid of the middle class. And I just like to say, uh, along with what you said, uh, you know, the constitution of the United States is an, an amazing document and it came out of a revolutionary war and I imagine their conditions must have been very difficult back then but they were able to come up with an amazing document that we all respect to this day and it can actually help to guide this movement yeah that's right exactly and um and uh, no, Molly, I think you said it very well. Uh, both of you did. <laughs> and the, you know, the one thing is that um, when you talk about the old boys club, obviously that's what it is. And I think the way I think of it is um, the top 1% wealthiest, um, that's, that is the, the old boys club. And who do they work for? They work for the top 1% of the top 1%. <laughs> You know, yeah. the top t one ten thousandth, um, you know, the people who really uh, actually have the keys to the printing press that prints the money. You know, we're, gonna, we're actually launching another new show called Global Central Bankers, which is going to uh, expose a lot about these people who run the, the central banks of the world and, and how they actually literally are. It's a private corporation, just like Walmart or McDonald's or Coca-Cola but they have an exclusive monopoly license by the U.S. Congress to print the U.S. dollar. I mean, obviously, uh, they print it, you know, contracting it through the, the mints, but um, obviously it's electronic now, so it's this digital funny money, and it's just done with, you know, typing zeros on a keyboard, literally. But when they create U.S. dollar, you know, Federal Reserve notes, U.S. dollars out of thin air, um, what do you think they do with it? They, it's their own. They print it for themselves. And then they can either spend it or they uh, mostly loan it to the U.S. government. So when people, everybody knows we have a national debt, but they don't really know who we owe it to. Nobody mm -hmm. even asks, like, who do we owe it to? Well, the, the number one uh, people that we owe it to are the people who printed the money and then loaned it to us. That This corporation... <laughs> printed our money, and then loaned it to us. I mean, oh my gosh, if, if, if people understood how that worked, they would just, well, they'd be rioting in the streets, wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah, so interesting. They're learning. It sounds kind of like what you're talking about there. Um, is that what we would call a Ponzi scheme? Oh my <laughs> gosh. It, and it's the, it's the biggest and the oldest Ponzi scheme ever. <laughs> You know, um, so it's that's gonna it's another show we're gonna talk about global central bankers. But we're gonna, I mean, I'm gonna have experts on, and we're gonna interview them and ask them all about how this really works because I under I understand the big picture, but I don't understand the details. Uh, but we're gonna explore that. It's gonna be really interesting um, about the Federal Reserve and all the the central banks um, of the world. Most of the central banks of the world are controlled by the government of that nation, I, as I understand it, but. The biggest ones are private, completely private, like the Federal Reserve is a private company, and um, the Bank of England as well. Um, so, 
All right, so now let's talk about what, what's really put, um, sadly, uh, has really put Oakland, uh, uh, Occupy Oakland on the map as far as um, is the events that have happened um, Tuesday night. So for those of you, before we start talking about it, let's, let's show that uh, video. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, of what actually occurred on Tuesday night. This is uh, uh, Marine veteran Scott Olson. Uh, and uh, a lot of other innocent protesters were actually fired upon by literally an army of local Oakland police um, in full, uh, what do you call it, riot gear, you know, even though there's no riot going on. So uh, let's see if we can roll that video. Take a look at this. Okay, so this is Scott Olson, the guy with the, the floppy hat there, standing right next to the Navy man. The, the Navy guy is carrying this flag that says, Veterans for Peace. That's an organization of uh, U.S. veterans. And that's Scott Olson to the right, as you can see. Uh, looks like he's wearing his army fatigues. He's just standing there peacefully, obviously, both of them. But that's just moments before the attack. And here's where they begin firing upon the protesters. And that they show Scott Olson standing right there. He's just standing there. Tear gas canister in the air. You still see him standing there. He's standing right there in this front and center. Is that the shot that felled him? Yeah, you know, he, he's standing right up front. And there he is down. It's hard to see so, from this video exactly how this demonstrator was wounded. But if you doubt that the police were deliberately aiming at the protesters, watch this policeman when a group of protesters attempt to come to the aid of the injured person. Yeah. Watch that again. Okay. Yeah, that's just disgusting to me. I mean, not only did they, like, right there, point blank, they, they shot him right in the face. He has, had, like, a two-inch gash in his skull. He had a skull fracture, as I understand it. And um, not only that, but then when a whole group of protesters come to his aid because he's fallen, there's, I don't know how many, uh, you know, riot police were standing there, they rush to, to his side to aid him, and they throw another one right in the middle of the crowd. That, that is not riot control. That is, that is military tactics. They're, they're, they're really at war with the actual citizens doing peaceful protests. So, so what do you guys think about all of this? I mean, what was your reaction when you first saw this? I mean, the same as, as everyone, the just total outrage. Um, you know, honestly, uh, a couple points. Um, it was not only the Oakland Police Department. There was uh, many, many uh, officers from all around the Bay that came uh, on that night. And it was a massive uh, military-type action against peaceful, nonviolent protesters. And, I mean, it, it, anybody looking at that video is, is outraged and... Yeah. Uh, I'd just like to say um, that Scott Olson does have a uh, fractured skull, we understand, and there's a website that's been set up uh, for his recovery uh, at ivaw.org. That's the Iraqi Vets Against the War. Uh, very easy to, to donate if anyone would like to. I-V-A-W. So it's I-V, like Victor, A-W.org. That's right. Okay, we'll yeah. put that up on the screen in a second. The, um, 
I mean, yeah, there's no two ways to interpret that video. There's just no way that you can look at that any other way. It's so obvious that, you know, that they, they shot him right in the face at point blank range. In, in the video, it looks like they're only five or ten feet away from where he was standing. They're right there, and then to have some, another officer just lob uh, another uh, uh, tear gas grenade into the crowd, it's, it's despicable. And uh, everybody that we talk to who hasn't been there already at Occupy Oakland, that's what motivated them is just yeah. that image. And that's going around the world right now as we speak. And, uh, you know, we should almost say thank you to the officers mm. who instigated that because they've created a bigger movement than existed before. Wow. At, at uh, what expense? That's so sad. The... the um Okay, now, do you, ha do you have any idea how many protesters there were that night? That, that night there was a, a, we weren't there that night, but there, we understand there was two, about 2,000 protesters that night. And, and uh, after, afterwards, it, the numbers grew to 3,000 easily uh, the next night. People returned mm -hmm. to downtown Oakland, mm -hmm. uh, an otherwise beautiful and very positive place, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they reclaimed... Um, Frank Agawa Plaza in front of the, the, the city hall. Um, uh, it's now called Oscar Grant Plaza by some. And, um, you know, it continued the next night. There, it keeps growing. The tents are back. They didn't achieve their objectives. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't understand why they even needed to take those tactics. What do you, do, does anybody, has anybody explained why they, you say they brought in police from many different jurisdictions around. Um, has anybody explained why they did that when they only have 2,000 protesters who are peacefully marching? Uh, well, I have to say that the, uh, because of budget cuts and, and conditions, uh, in the city, the Oakland Police Department is dramatically understaffed on, on er any day, and mm -hmm. let alone to deal with this kind of situation. Although they didn't need to take these kind of tactics, um, they have real legitimate problems that happen in Oakland like any other big city, as you can understand. Mm -hmm. There's murders, there's uh, uh, assaults, there's, there's domestic violence, and... Um, you know, th these were peaceful protesters that didn't require that kind of action. Right, and and like, whose command were they when they when they bring in, uh, you know, officers from other jurisdictions? Like, I wonder who's in charge. Like, uh, would it be the Oakland police um, chief still that would be in charge of the whole operation? As far as I understand, this was um, this operation. The people were in charge were the interim. Oakland Police uh, Department chief. He's, again, mm -hmm. interim chief, just mm -hmm. took over the job uh, mm -hmm. maybe within the last a week ago. I was going to say within the last month. but mm -hmm. And his name is um, Chief Jordan, Jordan, and he took over for Anthony Batts. I wish Anthony Batts had not left us. Mm -hmm. but um, And so an interim police chief who looks like a pretty young guy to me, and then Mayor Gene Kwan are the people responsible for what happened to Scott Olson. As, and that's... Um, what we are hearing from everybody at Occupy Oakland. Uh, however, the mayor wasn't even in the city at the time. Um, you know, we're, we're, it's unclear as to the chain of command, um, but it's, it's being investigated right now. The uh, 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 organization known as the Occupy Marines, obviously, uh, when something like this happens to a Marine anywhere, uh, you know they're going to support that person, right. so uh, they're they're looking into it, and um, you know we hope that uh, through legal action uh, we can we can uh, uh, really figure out what happened here. Yeah, we've seen the images and the stories. You, you you did this to my brother, but it's not just the Marines. I mean, obviously they have a special fraternity, but um, the every American. I mean, Marines are there to to defend this country, and and um, what they did to Scott Olson, they did to every American. That, that's just, that really is an act of war against the people of of the United States. So I mean, it's just unbelievable. So um, here it is. A uh, you know they're calling it a riot. Obviously, if they're bringing in all these riot police from all these different jurisdictions, and Mayor Kwan is not even in town, she's out of town, and then after the fact, 
she congratulated the police for, um, you know, for uh, carrying it out so smoothly with very little uh, problems or something to that effect, right? She was congratulatory, saying, oh, everything was, was, was well. And then until she found out, apparently later, uh, oops, it what didn't go as well as she thought. And then what, like 48 hours, was it two days or three days later, she came out and apologized to uh, Scott Olson and his family. Apparently. That's, uh, that's about what we're hearing. Um, when we were at the uh, General, o Occupy Oakland General Assembly last night, there was rumor um, that seemed to be confirmed by several reputable websites and you know, sources um, there at the scene that Jean Kwan, Mayor Jean Kwan, was going to come out and herself personally address the assembly and mm -hmm. speak to people. Um, myself, I mean, obviously I am not a fan of hers, but I was greatly concerned for her personal safety and seriously questioning her lack of judgment. Obviously, she has extremely poor judgment right. um, by what she decided was an, uh, the appropriate way to handle the peaceful crowd demonstrating on Tuesday night. She right. obviously right. has terrible judgment. And so she was supposed to come out last night and address the General Assembly mm. at 7 o'clock. Um, you might be surprised to hear she didn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, she must have gotten some good advice from somebody on her staff um, that you know she was going to have to come out in the Pope mobile. I think after after what happened, um, that's uh, I, I, that could have been a very bad thing actually. Yeah. Um, well, she she did she was there and she you know received a lot of negative feedback from the crowd and so she retreated. Uh, uh, but the way, the way she's been handling this uh, from a distance, uh, you know, it just really is full of uh, negligence. Mm -hmm. And the people of Oakland have no confidence in her ability to lead at this point. Um, you know, people are, are asking for her to, to resign and mm -hmm. uh, for her, or, or, or will seek her recall. Mm -hmm. um, you know, clearly something needs to be done. It's just the honorable thing. Mm -hmm. for um, in this kind of a situation right. um, so we'll see what happens with that yeah I got it we got a press release uh, here from from her office last night and I want to talk about that in uh, just a second but we got to take a break really quick quickly and uh, thank our sponsors obviously if it weren't for our, our uh, sponsors we wouldn't be here so we thank them greatly for uh, for uh, making this show possible um, Mt. Gox is uh, mtgox.com. If you don't know what Bitcoin is, we have another show called The Bitcoin Show, which will educate you all about that on Only One TV here. But Bitcoin is the peer-to-peer um, -peer distributed cryptocurrency. Basically, it's the money of the future. And uh, the cool thing about Bitcoin is that it's not issued by any government or bank or corporation or website or group of guys or anything like that. It's, com it's as decentralized as the internet itself. So theoretically, it can't be shut down by anyone. Um, Bitcoin, there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin in existence because it's a free open source software project that regulates itself by its own network. But they're basically effectively infinitely divisible. So you can have um, a millionth of a Bitcoin. So as the value goes up, you will still be able to use it. There'll never be a shortage of Bitcoin. So it's a really exciting new technology. And Mt. Gox is, um, one of the ways, one of the easiest ways to buy and sell Bitcoins for your local currency. So in other words, if you want to buy some Bitcoin uh, with your U.S. dollars, this is the place to do it. They actually deal in uh, 16, I think at least 16 currencies now, maybe more. Um, but it's mtgox.com, mtgox.com, and they have like a 90%, at least 90% market share um, in the online exchange world for buying and selling Bitcoins for currency. Um, so check out mtgox.com, and we thank them for, for sponsoring uh, the Occupy Wall Street show, and the Thank You Economy. Thank you, Thank You Economy. The Thank You Economy is uh, a book by Gary Vaynerchuk, who's a best-selling New York Times best-selling author. Uh, phenomenal. You might know him from uh, Wine TV uh, and uh, many other places. He's an amazing young guy, entrepreneur, brilliant, and he's an expert in social media. So you guys will be very familiar with him probably. He's um, he teaches you, whether you have a small or medium-sized or very large business, how to use social media and the modern technologies to bring your business back to uh, an, a time when 
people got personal customer service where you know they could actually give personal responsiveness to a customer and just like the old days you know with, with a local merchant so that no matter how big your company is you can still give personalized service to um, to your customers and give them uh, a feeling that their feedback matters and um, that you hear them and you respond so it's called thank you economy it's an excellent book by Gary Vaynerchuk and we thank you for sponsoring the Occupy Wall Street show so we're back now. I wanted to tell you guys. Uh, so la yeah, last night. I mean, you, I'm sure you've already seen it now, but um, we received the uh, press release. I, it was actually uh, late, like 1:30 a.m. here last night, right before I was falling asleep. But I read it and I was like, "Oh, this is good." You know, she's whatever. Uh, this was from the office of Mayor Kwan, and you know, apologizing and all that. Until I got to the fourth point. Uh, and I'm like, uh, but we ask that you not stay in the park. You know, after 10 p.m. and uh, I was like, oh my gosh, she doesn't get it. Like, the, since when does the Constitution's right, you know, for public assembly, and the public, you know, the public can't be on the public land. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the Constitution is on hold from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Pacific time, according to Mayor Kwan. Exactly. And she said uh, the plaza is available for free speech activity uh, you know, up until 10 p.m. Yeah, between certain and, hours. <laughs> you know, I... I I mean, I've read the Constitution, and I'm going to continue to reread the Constitution and try and find anywhere where the freedom of speech, the exercise thereof, is limited between certain hours. Right. I, I really don't see it that way. Yeah, and if the Constitution says that free speech is limited to, you know, uh, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., I mean, how do we even know? Is that Eastern time, Pacific time? You know, <laughs> like, you know since when are they rewriting the Constitution? You know, these... Yeah. Police officers, police chiefs, mayors, even governors, you know, are just making up their own rules as they go. And, and, and they, and they give sure them clever names and like it's a rule, it's a law, it's not. <laughs> and, and, and I'm sure that if, if a big corporation, uh, you know, now we know from the Supreme Court that in the uh, Citizens United case that uh, money for big corporations is free speech. And if they wanted to write a check after 10 o'clock, I'm sure the politicians would be happy to take that. <laughs> right, you, you got that right. They, 24 hours a day, they'll accept yeah. those donations anonymously too. You know, they can, <laughs> exactly. they can, they can do that. Yeah. So that no one actually knows which bank, um, you know, is donating their money. Um, so isn't it true, I read somewhere that, that Mayor Kwan was um, previously, before she was mayor, she was a protester and she had problems with the Oakland police herself? How, Certainly, I mean, uh, during the uh, uh, recent um, uh, Oscar Grant murder case, I'm sure that you've heard about that. Um, the people of Oakland, there's actually a long history here of police brutality. I mean, I'd like to say there's some really good police officers out there. I know them, and this does not reflect every one of them. But there is a problem amongst the community, and... Uh, this has been going on for a long time, but when uh, after uh, the Oscar Grant situation, you know, Mayor Kwan was actually down at the time she was a, a city council member, and she was down uh, in between the police and the protesters trying to ensure the peace. Hmm. Um, you know, and she has a long history of being a, a community activist as well. Um, and, you know, just at, at this point, though, uh, her leadership is uh, seriously in question. Mm -hmm. I wonder why she wasn't down there between the protesters and the police on Tuesday night. Yeah, she wasn't even in the city. She was apparently at in a fundraiser. DC, maybe getting money from <laughs> donors. I don't know. Wow. So what do you think? I mean, it sounds to me like, uh, you know... Uh, you know, people who have an, an inclination to be a thug often are attracted to the career of being a police officer because you have that ultimate authority of a, of a gun. You know, there's me and you and a gun, and, and my, you know, if I use it on you, it's your word against mine, and you're not here. So there, there, there is that, but it sounds like the police department there doesn't have um, the leadership, or maybe it does. You know, like, it, it's the leadership that determines, I think, the, the whole attitude and uh, culture of, of any organization, like a police force, 
So, I mean, what's the deal with the, poli the chief of police? We have an interim chief of police there now, and, and like, is he doing his job at all? Is he, is he encouraging this kind of violence, or is he just looking the other way? Or do we have any clue what's going on with that? You know, it, it, it's hard to speak as to what's happening internally with the police. You're right. Uh, the, the previous chief uh, resigned recently, just a week ago. So uh, I can't imagine this is an easy job for the interim chief, Jordan. He is from the area. He does know the situation. And, uh, you know, we just, we just need better from our police force. Mm -hmm. um, they work for the people. They, they shouldn't be the ones causing uh, the problem. And I, honestly, I've heard that, that many police have resigned because of what happened to Scott Olson and what happened the other night. Wow. And uh, so we've heard, I can't verify that, but I've heard that. And I know that various police, sheriff, fire department, ambulance drivers, they all stand in solidarity, you know, with, with mm -hmm. the Occupy movement. Well, they're supposed to work for the people, but they actually work for the city and the, the politicians, and the politicians are supposed to work for the people, but yeah. we're right back where we started again. They don't. <laughs> they work for the, the corporations that are, owned, that are owned by the banks and the, yeah. the bankers. So, yeah, so really they're the private security. They're like mall cops. They're the private yeah. security force of the elite who have, the, yeah. who have all the money and power. And, and uh, yeah, it's very sad because they are local citizens. They're working guys and, and gals just like us, but, um, but they're under orders. And so I can't imagine being in that, put in that situation where you have to fire up on your own. I mean, in this country of all places, you know, we think we're so superior when it comes to democracy. We're going to spread our democracy, all, make war to uh, spread our democracy because we're so su superior. But we really need to get our own act together, obviously. Um, and the, the vacuum of leadership also leaves the, those police forces at risk, uh, sure. besides the protesters. Sure. Uh, they don't want to operate, uh, you know, individually, they probably don't want to operate uh, in, in a situation that could get out of control. You know, right. that's not in anybody's best interest. Right, I know. It's like, but it makes you wonder, like, what went wrong? I mean, literally, when they're standing there in formation, in riot gear, and there's no riot, what are they thinking? Did somebody give them the order to throw the... They, somebody obviously gave the order. So yeah, who they, gave the I, order? Do we have any information about who did this and I, who gave the order? I really wish that I knew who, who initially said, pull the trigger. The yeah. protesters aren't moving like we told them to, so pull the trigger. I wish I knew who... I mean, was it Gene Kwan from Washington, D.C.? Was it this interim chief, Jordan? I wish that I knew who gave that order, but mm -hmm. I don't. And I, you know, from everyone that we're talking to down there and from everything that I'm paying attention to on the internet, you know, local news sources, all of that, I have not heard anyone take responsibility or point the finger at who literally said, pull the trigger. But I just can't, I, I'm, it's unfathomable that this mm -hmm. was the way that Gene Kwan, Chief Jordan, and all the other powers that be that perpetrated this violence against the innocent, peaceful citizens of Oakland. I can't believe that they thought this was the way to solve the problem, which there wasn't a problem. We were peacefully protesting. Yeah. And I, I say we because I've been there every other day except for that since um, yeah. October 15th. But um, Thank God you weren't there. You might have been one of the victims. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's, and, and even after the fact, I mean, there's a before fact, there's a who did it, and, um, but, I mean, ob the, ob the responsibility uh, is obvious. Uh, you know, like you say, the chief of police and the mayor have the ultimate uh, responsibility for what, that's their job. Um, and then to say, oh, I apologize. You know, that's like, oh, oops, my bad. You know, that, that is just, to me, that's just unbelievably inappropriate of a response. That's not how you respond to shooting someone in the face. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And then, oh, and by the way, uh, you still have to be out at 10 p.m. You yeah. know, right. obviously just out of touch with what is happening in her world. Clearly, you're right. And I just want to say that we will have accountability eventually. The truth will come out. And uh, really, um, their tactics were terrible because it only served to increase the, the presence of, of the protesters. 3,000 people came back the next night because of what happened. 
People are outraged. And honestly, this is a distraction. This is not a, a movement against the police. This right. is a movement against corporate interests in politics. And this is a distraction from the real issues. Uh, and, and, you know, we need to... We need to get accountability. We need we need to figure out what happened, but we also need to refocus, and that's what happened afterwards. Um, I don't know if you know, but at a general assembly the next night, it was agreed upon uh, almost unanimously unanimously by yeah. three thousand people that we are going to have a general strike in the city of Oakland on November second, Wednesday. Uh, hopefully, we're going to have union support. Um, small business support, just people in general support. And, um, you know, we're going to seize, seize the opportunity while there's attention on us to really make a statement. And, um, you know, it, it, this is, again, it's not a, against the police in any way. It, it, it's mm -hmm. against corporate control. Yeah, and so taking back our, politi our politicians need to be accountable to the people, and so we need to do a clean sweep of all the politicians who are not accountable to the people and yeah. uh, just get rid of them and replace them with, with, with politicians that are accountable to the people and yeah. not the corporate interests and, the, and mainly the banks, and of course the banks own the corporations. The, um, and yeah, people I think that... Agree, the, they sorry? need to step up. People who agree need to step up and, and take over the political uh, structure locally exactly. um, all the way up the chain. And, and that's really the only way that this movement is, is going to, uh, this grassroots movement is going to grow is, yeah. you know, it, through responsible action. And the way that we've seen it happen at the General Assembly, uh, you know, people are very capable of discussing what's important to them. Right, exactly. And the the I um, I knew about the uh, strike, the general strike. And I don't know if you knew the General Assembly here in New York. I read uh, had voted in solidarity to also do that. So I think it's it's a, now going to be a nationwide strike, right? That's fantastic. November. What is it? November second. November second. November second. Put that on the screen. So it's a general strike nationwide. Who knows? It may be by the time <laughs> by the time this airs, maybe worldwide already. Um, I, I did see somebody referencing, you know, uh, trying to make it a worldwide strike November second. Yeah. But um, imagine if everybody just uh, just take a sick day, just don't go to work yeah. uh, on November second. That's a Wednesday, you said, right? Mm -hmm. Wednesday, November second. Just call in sick or whatever. Just don't go to work and see what happens. Um, see, see how the politicians and the corporations function without the people. <laughs> and uh, I think it'll prove a point. You know, the people are in solidarity. They're not all sleeping on the sidewalks down there at Wall Street and at the park, you know. But, uh, but they're like you and me. They're normal, average typical Americans um, who are absolutely in solidarity and behind what uh, these 23-year-olds had the, you know, the yeah. courage to do, to actually go down there and start this thing. We all felt it. And that's why I think this, this movement has resonated with everybody. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, it, it, it is. It's resonating hard with everybody, and I'm so happy about that. You mm -hmm. can feel that resonance. When we go down to the General Assemblies and we take part, you can feel the resonance. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, but I do just back to the strike on November 2nd. I mm -hmm. want to say one more thing about that just to give a little historical perspective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the last general strike that happened in America was in 1946 and it was in guess what city? Oakland. That's right. Hey. <laughs> it was in Oakland. The city was shut down for 56 hours and you better believe some changes were made after that last general strike for the betterment of the people of Oakland. And I believe, again, the people of Oakland, the people of New York, and whatever other cities stand with us in solidarity, mm -hmm. we will be heard and we will change things for the better. Yeah. You think if there's a general, if there's a nationwide general strike or even bigger worldwide general strike uh, on November 2nd, do you think that the mainstream corporate owned media are going to report it? <laughs> they won't have anybody to operate the cameras, but, you know, the next day. <laughs> that would be great if they had nobody, you They know. might notice. Yeah. 
we're, we're hoping next Wednesday that some people are going to notice. Yeah. Because it is, I mean, talking about people noticing, it is weird. Like, when we, we'll go down to the Occupy movement and to the General Assembly and then leave to, like, go charge our cell phones real quick at a restaurant, like, around the corner or yeah. something like that. And it's so bizarre to be so intensely involved right. at the movement and then go to a restaurant and everybody's there eating and drinking and, and they're around the corner from Oscar Grant Plaza and they have no idea what's going on. Yeah, they're just and at happy so hour at Ruby Tuesday and they're in their own little right. world. They're going to get home to watch Dancing with the Stars. I know. I have the same experience here too in New York. I, you know, like heading home or whatever and, and you get you know, maybe eight blocks away and you just see these people, they're just in their own oblivious world. They have no idea what's going on, but they've heard about it. I mean, now they're starting to hear, actually Fox News, believe it or not, did a poll and at some point, I forgot what the number is now, but I think 70% or something of Americans know about it. But what they know about it is the question because if they're getting the news from Fox News, then it can't be good. But um, thank God, there's not a day that goes by that I don't thank God for the internet because the internet is the new media. And um, who needs the old media? Just boycott it. <laughs> it's irrelevant. Uh, irrelevant. Old, old media is irrelevant. That's true. We, we, you know, we have another show, <laughs> I'll plug another show called Absotechly, where we teach you how to buy this little thing called a boxy box, and one end plugs into the internet, the other plugs into your HDTV, and you get a remote control, and you get all your TV and movies you want for free, and you don't have to rely on the broadcast or cancel your cable. All you need is internet, and that's the wow. future anyway. So every 20-year-old every will tell you that's where you get TV, movies, and, and music. So you don't need to rely on this old media's outdated, obsolete, and, and irrelevant. And the... Occupy Oakland movement is speaks to that. It's a it's a diverse, horizontally organized movement. I mean, there are no leaders. It, it's all done through consensus. Uh, we seek in Oakland ninety percent consensus to right. take any action. Wow, that's great. And you might think that that's difficult, but we break up in small groups. We talk amongst ourselves. We respect everybody. We respect people who dissent, mm -hmm. and we listen. And uh, take action from there, and if you can't get 80% uh, uh, consensus, then you're encouraged to reword your proposal and bring it back later. Um, you know, it's just amazing to see democracy operate this way, right. as opposed to seeing people being shouted down and uh, intimidated and, and told that they don't understand the, the issues. I, I believe that people uh, know better than most politicians, the issues that, that affect them in their daily life. That's right. I know. And we, again, we think we live in this free democratic, uh, you know, country. And um, most of us, I know in my lifetime, I've never, I, I was really, really intrigued by what you're talking about too, this direct democracy. And I've never seen that in my life, um, actual real democracy, except maybe in, you know, in, a, in someone's home or something, <laughs> the dining room table. But I've never seen it actually, actually work like that. And um, I'm, that's one of the things we're going to really explore on this show in coming episodes is um, real in-depth how that really works and wh what's the history of this, uh, this whole, I mean, the sign language, the whole system of direct democracy is really intriguing. And that's what they're not, the mainstream corporate media is not even talking about. Of course, they don't want to mention that. But um, that's the most interesting aspect of it is how people are directly... Uh, participating in this. So I know that you or me or any uh, anybody who's watching can go down there in New York at Wall Street at Liberty, you know, Liberty Square and at four o'clock for the facilitators meeting any day, you can have a proposal put onto the agenda for that GA that night, that General Assembly, and then that General Assembly will, will vote on it. They, I think they do, if I understand it right, they do like a temperature check and they have to have consensus. But if it's not, then you know, people can object and uh, you can work it out with the people who object and come back and propose it again, um, and so on and so on. It's, it's this whole formal structure, which is just amazing. And like I said, in, in my lifetime, I've never seen that before. It was just like, wow. This is new technology, and there's not, it's, it's so low tech, it's shocking, that especially the human mic, we're like, what? <laughs> you know, why aren't they using a big screen TV like at a rock concert or you know, Twitter or something? But it's, it's so low tech, it's, it's beautiful in its simplicity. It absolutely is. I mean, I have to say, I love the people's mic. And, you know, when I wasn't, when I first was watching you guys there in New York with the people's mic, you know, before things got started up here in, at Occupy Oakland, it was a little weird, I have to admit, yeah. to watch it on TV. And I didn't quite 
get it. Right. You, I, I'm telling all your viewers, please go down to your <laughs> local general assembly, your local Occupy movement, and join their general assembly and see this democracy that we're talking yeah. about in action. See the people's mic. You know, see what a beautiful process true democracy is. It's yeah. absolutely beautiful to see it happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have to say, um, the first General Assembly at Occupy Oakland that I was involved in, they said, um, you know, everybody break up into groups of 20. That's how, you know, you might wonder how 3,000 people get together and make a decision. And, and, you know, we pass things, we vote on things and pass them with a 90% consensus. Mm -hmm. Well, it happens because we break up into groups of 20. And I thought, the first time they said break, break up into groups of 20 and there were thousands of people there, I thought, <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Well, that's 100 that's, groups of 20. Yeah, it, it actually, it worked, and it, nobody was talking over anybody, everybody, I'm, I mean everybody's voice was heard, and it, it was smooth, um, it was organized, and it, it, really, it really works, and I think right now the way that our government treats us is like we're all children, or like we're too stupid to govern ourselves, you know, right. like we're too stupid to to be able to make the right decisions. Mm -hmm. And um, you can go, I, I feel that other general assemblies would be the same as at Occupy Oakland. The people are not too stupid. Right. <laughs> and they, they are able to make um, you know, decisions, especially decisions that uh, have to do with their living conditions. Sure. And um, yeah, the city that they're living in and all of that. Exactly, yeah. It has nothing to do with being stupid. They just, and when, when it comes to our government, we just didn't write a big enough check. But of course, the, the, the most wisdom there is, is the people. The people's wisdom, and, and it so. might be it might be difficult. It might be a little messy, but it's also inspiring, and you know it's inclusive and it's empowering to the people as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people for sure. People really care. Like if they feel like they have a voice and like they're being heard, they suddenly care. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, it's, and it's really nice to see people who, uh, you know, as Matt said earlier about feeling, you know, people feel disenfranchised, and that's um, a big part of what this movement is about. It's like to, it's really wonderful to watch those people, ourselves included, who feel disenfranchised to have a voice. Right. It's just such a beautiful thing to see. Like you say, the human mic at first, I was like, what? They got to come up with a better, you know, technology. I got all about technology. But you're right, it grows on you. And you know, some people criticized it and said, it's like a cult, it's like a brainwashing tool. But then I've heard the, you know, it's all, in, it's all in how you look at it, right? I heard, I read somewhere else on Twitter, someone was saying, I love the human mic because you really hear everything. Because when you hear it and it's repeated and you repeat it, it, every word sinks in. Yeah, it really does sink in. And it's, you know, it's obviously it's not brainwashing because it's, this is exactly what is being said and what's being discussed and what's being voted on. It's a, it's a great, great thing. Um, a it, lot of times, uh, you know, at, at city council meetings or local political actions, uh, people can't hear very well or they're out in the hall or, right. or they're left margins. And really, this is about communication and making sure we're clear and we know what we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, you talk, you can't get more active as a listener. When you talk about active listening, you know, when you're yeah. in a big, huge auditorium, you could be in uh, Madison Square Garden, somebody's got a microphone and the whole place hears it, but, um, but you, you know, you could be sleeping through the thing. As you've seen, you ever see these videos in Congress where, you know, the representatives are snoring and, and you know, obviously they're not actively listening, but you can't listen, hear it, repeat it, you know, um, without being awake <laughs> and actually hearing it. So um, Ed's asking, what about the children? What, do you, what are, the, are the kids getting involved in this? And um, uh, how, are, how do they take to, uh, to this whole protest? It, sometimes, I mean, it looks like a, a happy, festive carnival sometimes. You know, it's inspiring to see uh, children there. Uh, of course, you know, you would never want children to be there when, when the SWAT uh, teams the are there. Are acting the way that they did the other night. Right. But uh, certainly during the, uh, the hours that we've been allowed to express our free speech, there are people with children. In Oakland, we have a, a, a kids' fun zone there, uh, you know, amongst other organizational uh, uh, tents. Uh, and, you know, I'd just like to say that the tents are back up uh, in front of City Hall. Um, they're... They're not gone. They're returning, and um, they're growing all the time. And there's a, a food, not bombs, has a, 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 a tent that they serve free food. Mm -hmm. There's an organization of, uh, you know, they keep it clean, dishwashing. It's amazing. Uh, there's medical 
attention for people. And there is a, a kid zone where, you know, uh, you can't just drop off your kid, but if you mm -hmm. want to spend some time with your kid there, um, you know, there's all sorts of fun things for kids to do. That's cool. And how they, so the, the, the tents are back. Are they, they're camping overnight? They're not going, they're not leaving at 10. As of last night, they, they're back and uh, uh, they're, it's growing and uh, we'll see. We'll are see. the police leaving them alone at night, like last night? As far as we've heard, I mean, the first tent that I saw go back up, I have a picture of it. You, you know, check my Twitter feed. It's there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 very, the very first tent that I saw go back up was on Wednesday night, the night after the riots. Oh, wow. Um, oh, wow. And it was awesome just to see that one lone tent back mm -hmm. there saying, uh, you know, we're reclaiming Oscar Grant Plaza for the yeah. 99%. And um, then last night, by the time we left the General Assembly, there was maybe 25, 25 tents, mm -hmm. something like that. So I'm really curious to see, um, you know, what it's going to be when we head back down today. And I do have to say thank you to, you know, New York City Occupy Wall Street movement. I heard that um, there was, uh, what was it, 100 tents or something like that. And right. uh, I wish I could remember off the top of my head what how much money it was. Yeah, it was like, twenty. I think I read that twenty thousand dollars. The GA dollars decided. Yeah, they voted and they they said they want to send twenty thousand dollars to occupy Oakland to for tents and medical and legal and whatever the needs are there. So that should show up today, and also Michael Moore should be there today. So mm -hmm. uh, you know you can we'll let you know how that goes, but uh, mm -hmm. we anticipate that movement just going to grow mm -hmm. and the, the tents are just going to continue to come. So we just want to say we want to say thank you to Occupy Wall Street, New York City, and yeah. thank you to Michael Moore for coming to support us today. We really, really appreciate it. Thanks, you guys. Yeah, absolutely. We're all in this together. It doesn't matter where we are. It's just it's one one movement, and what not even just nationwide. It's global. It's really, really global because the bankers rule the the entire earth. It's not even national, and uh, so that's why everybody's impacted with this. Yeah. You know, that's why they're writing in Greece and Italy and everywhere else. It's all the same thing. It's these absolutely the the one percent of the one percent. Oh, I was just I was just gonna say speaking of global, you just said that this is something global happening. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you're aware, but they're marching in um Tahrir, they're marching over in Egypt today. Um I'm not I don't know if they're starting in Tahrir Square, but I'm sure that there's gonna be an Occupy movement there. It is directly in solidarity with Occupy Oakland and you know and against the act police actions that happened the other night. I believe the people of Tahrir Square um, yeah. know a thing or two about that and can relate to the yeah. footage that they've seen on TV. And the citizens of Egypt who are standing in solidarity with Occupy Oakland are marching today on the U.S. Embassy. And I'm just so, um, I, I am thrilled that this is a global thing and that the people united will never be divided. Right. So we feel the support in Oakland. We talk about it. We're aware of it. Uh, so, you know, Wherever you are, if you feel like showing some support, you know, just reach out. It, it, it's amazing what this one word of encouragement can do. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter who. And these top, the top 1% of the top 1% who are really pulling the strings, they, you know, I know for, for months now, they've got to have been shaking in their, sh in their boots because as soon as this started, they're like, uh-oh. We really went too far, I think, and they really have. And now they everything is a reflex, like a reactionary thing. Like, what do we do now? You know, the the Albany. You heard about what happened in Albany, upstate New York. Here, the, the you know the governor gave direct orders to the mayor arrest these protesters, and the mayor gave direct orders to the police arrest these protesters, and the police said no. Yep. Screw you. We are the experts in policing. The mayor and the governor are not. And these people are peacefully protesting. We are not going to arrest them. They don't even have the... F they, they're like, this, that will cause a riot. And they don't, they're not geared up for that. So they did the right thing. And they, they do not have to follow orders if it's not constitutional. So um, it's, a, it's a message to police policemen and police uh, you know, chiefs and, and departments all over the, the country that uh, you don't have to follow orders that are non-constitutional, not in this country. You know, in no. fact, you, you could be actually committing a crime if you do. You know, if, you take, if you follow orders uh, to do something illegal, then you're still doing something illegal. So you really want to think about it before you uh, assault someone for, for, uh, you know, for <laughs> acting in accordance with the law. So, and, uh, and we... The, the Occupy, uh, you know, they call them protesters, but it's hard to call them protesters at this point. Uh, the movement um, will support 
any police officer, anybody who 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 will support us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think that you, you're seeing that more and more. Like in New York City police, you can tell, I mean, especially the blue suit, I mean, the blue shirt, you know, normal uh, cops are, you can see they, they have a lot of empathy for what's going on. They, you know, on, on a different day, they might actually be in there joining. But, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's coming from the top. The, the orders are coming from the top. You know, yeah. billionaire Bloomberg is, the, you know, the, definitely in the 1%. I mean, they're all owned, you know, in that, that pyramid scheme of this Ponzi system we have. And uh, the commands are coming down from on top. But, um, you know, the people, the 99%, were too big to fail, right? <laughs> I, yeah. I see this thing growing and growing and growing. And every time they pull something like this, um, yeah. they don't even know um, that they're pouring kerosene on this fire. And exactly. uh, they're just making it explode with uh, growth. So um, it's a, it's, I think it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time yep. to be alive in, in, in an American, especially that, you know, since 1776, we haven't seen a revolution like this one that's coming. And if nothing else, uh, this has shown that apathy is dead. Um, people, yeah. young, not just young people, but a lot of young people, old people, a uh, very diverse group of people, at least here in Oakland, uh, that, that I can only speak to what I've seen myself, um, mm -hmm. it, it are motivated, uh, and they're no longer apathetic, they're no longer content to sit back on the couch and flip through the channels. Uh, you know, there's this, this is direct action that's taking place on a broad scale. Yeah. I, can, we can, I mean, I can totally, it's forgivable, uh, in a way, people's apathy for this whole generation, because you know, you felt like there's nothing you can do about it. And, yep. you know, they were right. I mean, in a way, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, you're, even my parents' generation, you know, they're, they're, it's like everything's stacked against you and you can't fight the man and all that. And it's true. They were right. But um, eventually there is. Ultimately, when it really comes down to it, it's, it's uh, almost like a, a war. It's a, it's a revolution that, that the only thing you can do about it is to change everything. We really need to, to wipe, you know, wipe the whole slate clean and start over with a new idea of, of how it really should be done. And, and, and there's nothing to be afraid of. It, this is not some kind of, you know, uh, you know, it's just not something that sh people should fear. It's a natural rebalancing. Right. Uh, you know, I, I believe that uh, things have happened throughout human history yeah. similar to this. And you know, it's really if you if you're speaking the truth, if you have good intentions, you know, there's nothing to fear about right. this. It doesn't have to be uh, painful, or, or uh, it might be a little inconvenient, especially when the strike happens. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, you know, it, it's, we want to really maintain peaceful, nonviolent action. Um, I know that there are some that that don't feel that way. I can only speak for myself. But there's a lot of people that feel that way in this movement, and we know, uh, you know, the right thing to do, and, and we believe in each other. Yeah, exactly. So we just need to. We just need to. It's just going to be a new and improved version of the uh, the America that we thought we had. And, exactly. Uh, and we some fundamental changes, maybe. Like we have, we, we know we're very familiar with uh, separation of church and state. We need a separation of corporation and state. We need separation Absolutely. of corporation and politician. And, and banks uh, that are, you know, predatory and, and evil, you know, need to be whatever. Whatever they need to be, we'll decide whether they need to be nationalized or eliminated or whatever. Um, if they're too big to fail, then they absolutely must fail, you know, and things like that, you know. <laughs> so anyway, well, we're gonna we're gonna have to just like it's just gonna be a new a ver version 2.0 <laughs> of, of real democracy. Absolutely, and so. you know, you're talking about people feeling like, oh, it's too hard, I can't get involved, or it's gonna be too complicated or too inconvenient. Mm -hmm. And I just want to comment that um, what if people back during uh, the time of Martin Luther King? had said, you know, in the time of the civil rights protests, had said the same thing. This is this is too inconvenient. This is too hard. Mm -hmm. This um, is going to get in the way. I, I need to make it to work today. What if, what if people had said that? Where right. would we be today? Where exactly. would we be today? Exactly. That will never work. Well, we are out of time. Thank you so much, Molly and Matt, for joining us. And uh, it, it was a great, great uh, conversation. And uh, I hope that we'll, uh, we'll talk more again soon. And 
uh, catch up on, on the latest developments in this Occupy movement. Thanks so much Thank for, you for your, Thank you for your interest in, in what's happening here in Oakland. Sure thing. So remember, guys, uh, what we hold in our hearts and minds grows, so be very careful what you hold there. Everyone has their own unique area of brilliance, so let yours shine. And we'll see you soon. Great.